Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture, first lecture on neoplasia. As we all know, cancer is one of the leading causes of mortality among the non-communicable diseases that afflict human beings, the others being as you know cardiovascular diseases and so on. Why are cancers so important? Just because they are common, um, it is also because they, they um, cause a lot of suffering or morbidity in the patients and they affect the patients, the family members and the caregivers to a large extent because it is a very difficult disease to treat and to overcome. So, in this lecture we will be talking about the causes for cancer, a little bit about the causes and more importantly the properties of a cancer cell, how it is different from a benign cell. Uh, in other words, the differences between a benign and a malignant cell and we will also be uh, uh, talking a little bit about um, uh, the different properties of cancer and why it, be, it is so different from other diseases. Right, so we will move on to the properties of cancers. So, before we get into the details of the different aspects of cancers, there are some general uh, rules and properties that we need to understand about cancers. The first and foremost is that cancer is a genetic disorder caused by DNA mutations. Now, this is central to the understanding of how cancer occurs. The second point that we need to understand is these genetic alterations in the cancer cell are passed to daughter cells upon cell division. So, since these changes occur within the genes of the cells, when the cells divide the same genetic changes are passed on to the daughter cells. The third point is that when these genetic mutations are passed on, the fittest of the cells which, which get the most beneficial mutations survive. So, this is some kind of a Darwinian selection that occurs within the cancer cells. The last and not the least is that the mutations and epigenetic alterations that occur in these cells give rise to a set of phenotypic characteristics in the cells which makes it what it is the cancer cell which can invade and which can go to distance, uh, distant parts of the body what is known as metastasis. So, these are all the hallmarks of cancer. Now, if you look at all these properties, the fact that it is a genetic disorder, the fact that these genetic alterations can be transmitted to cells, the daughter cells and the fact that only the fittest of these cells survive and grow and progress and the fact that these genetic changes give a whole lot of phenotypic characteristic to the cells, it makes us think whether the cancer, the new growth is almost like a whole organism in itself because it can grow independently, it can um, uh, move independently within the human body and finally, it can even lead to the death of the patient. Right, before we move on to these different aspects of cancer cells and the properties, there are certain nomenclature that we need to understand. This is because we need to talk the same language. We need to use words that are understood by pathologists, by clinicians, by patients and by everyone in a uniform way. And so, we have certain nomenclature that we use for cancers. So, let us go on to each of these words one by one. The first is neoplasia, the word itself means 
new growth, neoplasia. Right. The second word is oncology, which is nothing but the study of tumors or the logos or study of onco or tumors. The third is which everyone understands benign and malignant. These words depend on how the cancers behave. The ones that are localized do not invade and can be easily removed are known as benign. In other words, their behavior is benign and those that grow beyond the confines of the organ that invade and the, those that go beyond the organ or which metastasize are known as malignant tumors. So, benign and malignant. And finally, the word cancer is loosely used as a collective term for all malignant tumors, whatever type it is. There are some other uh, words that we need to understand. Uh, that is the tumor cells. As you see in the labeled diagram in front of you, the tumor cells are those that are forming loose gland like structures. This is taken from a ductal carcinoma of the breast and these are the cells that are invading into the stroma. So, what you see as the tumor cells is loosely known as the parenchymal cells and the surrounding tissue is known as the stroma. The name for the cancer actually comes from the type of the parenchymal cells rather than the stromal cell. Now, I will give you examples of this as we move on. Right. Now, you also have uh, the, an, a separate set of nomenclature for benign and malignant tumors. Now, for the benign tumors, we attach an OMA or OMA. For instance, you have a fibroma, which is a tumor that occurs from the fibrous tissue, chondroma that has cartilaginous or chondrite differentiation, adenoma where the benign tumor forms gland like structures, papilloma where there are finger like projections on a surface, those are known as papillomas such as those you get on the skin and so on. And if there is a cyst like formation, you have what are known as cyst adenomas, which are quite common in the ovary. Now, we move on to the nomenclature that we use for malignant tumors. You have sarcomas, which are solid mesenchymal tumors, osteosarcoma, when the sarcoma forms uh, bone, chondrosarcomas, when it forms cartilage liposarcoma when it differentiates towards fat tissue and so on and so forth. You also have leukemias and lymphomas. These are non-solid malignancies in the sense that they arise from hematolymphoid or uh, the blood forming cells and these arise either in the bone marrow or in lymph nodes and other extranodal uh, sites which has lymphoid tissue. Then you have carcinomas, which, which refers to cancers that arise from epithelial structures and you have in carcinomas, you have adenocarcinomas when a gland like formation occurs and you have squamous cell carcinomas when the carcinoma cells differentiate towards squamous cells. When you really cannot make out how it is differentiating, but you know it is arising from an epithelial cell, you just call it an undifferentiated carcinoma. When uh, sometimes you have tumors uh, which you know arise from the epithelial uh, 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 structures, but they really do not differentiate either towards adeno or squamous and they look completely undifferentiated, then you call them undifferentiated carcinomas. Now, there are also other tumors, uh, the teratomas which arise uh, the tumors that arise from all three germ uh, layers, more than one germ layer, it qualifies as a teratoma. Uh, the germ li layers meaning ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. So, teratomas are quite common in the, um, uh, I mean understandably they are quite common in the genital organs, because you have in those organs cells that are pluripotential and capable of differentiating towards all the germ cell layers. 
Now, this is just a table that differentiate that uh, gives you a nomenclature of benign and malignant neoplasms. So, you have the tumors what I have already discussed tumors of mesenchymal origin, fibroma, the malignant counterpart would be a fibrosarcoma, lipoma, liposarcoma, and so on and so forth. And way down, you have hemangiomas and angiosarcomas. And then from muscle, you have lyomyoma and lyomyosarcomas. And tumors of epithelial origin, squamous cell papilloma is the benign counterpart, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma are the malignant counterparts. Right. So, having discussed the uh, nomenclature of benign and malignant uh, neoplasms, we will now briefly uh, go into the fundamental features of uh, uh, features that distinguish benign and malignant neoplasms. What are the key features that make benign and malignant neoplasms behave the way they do? Now, there are three fundamental features that distinguish benign and malignant neoplasms. The first is differentiation and anaplasia. Now, we will go into each of these. Uh, first, let me list all the three differentiation and anoplasia, local invasion and lastly metastasis. Now, differentiation and anaplasia, what are these, what do these terms stand for? Now, differentiation means the extent to which neoplasms resemble the cell of origin. Now, when we say this, what do we mean? Suppose, you have a cancer arising on the skin. Now, to what extent does this uh, tumor that is arising from the skin, which is a carcinoma, which is usually a squamous cell carcinoma, to what, to what extent does it resemble the normal skin? So, according to that, we say it is either well differentiated or very poorly differentiated. Now, usually uh, one of the hallmarks of cancer is that it, 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 it is less differentiated than the normal structure. Now, the, the better differentiated the cell is, it may even retain some of the functional activities of that organ. For instance, suppose it is a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, the same example that we took of the skin. So, even this tumor may produce keratin. So, that is because as we know the normal skin also produces keratin. right? So, the, the better the differentiation, it may retain the functional activities of the cell. Sometimes, it can differentiate backwards, which means it loses all the structural and functional differentiation of normal cells. So, the more the malignant the tumor is, it will be more less, it will be less differentiated and it will also tend towards backward differentiation. Let me give you this example. This slide shows the same squamous cell carcinoma I talked about and the arrow points towards keratin. So, it is a reasonably well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, which has retained the functional properties and which is why it is producing keratin. Now, what are the morphological features of anaplasia? When do we say that when we look at a cell that it is anaplastic or it is less differentiated? One feature is pleomorphism of cells. Now, what do you mean by pleomorphism? Pleomorphism means there is difference in size and shape of the cells. The second feature is nuclear features. You have different nuclear features that point towards anaplasia. For instance, you have hyperchromatism or a darkly staining nucleus, more dark than what it normally is. This is understandable because a malignant cell has more DNA. So, it will also look more blue or it will look more hyperchromatic. It will show pleomorphism. In other words, even the nuclei will show differently sized shapes and um, uh, sizes from cell to cell. It may show prominent nucleoli. Some of the cells may uh, join together to form tumor giant cells. I will show you a picture. 
It may show mitosis which are atypical, which means it is not the normal mitotic spindle that we see. We may see a tripolar mitosis, we may see a flower like mitosis and we may see uh, different kinds of uh, mitotic figures. There is loss of polarity, which means the normal relationship to one cell with another is lost. So, these are all the features that, um, that, uh, that are hallmarks of anaplasia. Now, this is a striking example of pleomorphism, where uh, this is from a, a muscle forming malignant tumor that is a rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, which unfortunately occurs in children and young adults. And you see these cells which are large, highly pleomorphic and look at the size of the nucleus, it is greatly enlarged, even showing one or two nucleoli. And on the right side, you also have a tumor giant cell. Uh, which has multiple nuclei within it. So, this is a malignant tumor showing the features of anaplasia. This is a picture to show you uh, an atypical mitotic figure from another uh, malignant neoplasm. As you can see in the center of the picture, that is a tripolar mitotic figure, which is in no way a normal uh, mitotic figure. So, these kind of mitosis are almost always features of malignant tumors. Now, when we talk of anaplasia, there is another term that we normally use in, uh, in the study of cancers and that word is dysplasia. Now, what is dysplasia? Now, dysplasia is commonly used in uh, a cancer uh, or in a neoplasm uh, to denote uh, the loss in the uniformity of cells and in their architectural orientation. Now, we must remember that the me if you just say dysplasia, it is not synonymous with cancer. In other words, even a pre-invasive stage of a tumor uh, such as a carcinoma in situ of the skin or the cervix can show dysplasia. So, dysplasia does not mean uh, cancer only when there is invasion does a tumor become cancer. Right. This is a picture to uh, just demonstrate what we mean by uh, dysplasia. Uh, uh, on the left, you see uh, uh, the, the, the epithelium, the full thickness, which is showing a loss of polarity of cells and they are not normal cells. There is pleomorphism, there is a higher power view next to it, there are quite a few mitotic figures. So, this is dysplasia, this is severe dysplasia occurring within the epithelium. It is still not become a cancer, because the basement membrane as you see is intact and there is no invasion into the underlying stroma. Right, the next property of cancer cells, which is local invasion. Now, what do you mean by local invasion? Now, malignant tumors by definition, they can infiltrate and they can invade the surrounding stroma and destroy the surrounding tissue. This is an inherent property of malignant tumors, whereas benign tumors usually are limited and they are usually surrounded by a fibrous capsule and they can be just enucleated from the organ. That is why you can easily remove a benign tumor, whereas a malignant tumor sort of throws its fingers, invading fingers all around and goes into the stroma and it is very difficult to get a plane, a normal plane between the tumor and the surrounding tissue uh, to take it out. These are examples of uh, two tumors that occur in the breast, very common tumors. Uh, uh, one is the fibroadenoma or the, uh, uh, the benign tumor. As you can see, it is a very well circumscribed tumor, which is completely uh, well circumscribed and separate from the normal uh, surrounding breast tissue. So, the surgeon can easily uh, remove, just scoop out the tumor and retain the normal tissue around it. Whereas, in the lower panel, you can see a carcinoma, uh, uh, the central scar like tissue, which has very ragged uh, borders, which are infiltrating into the surrounding stroma. And the surgeon has removed a whole 
lot of normal rim of breast tissue in order to get a clearance to remove this tumor and clearly you can see the way it is infiltrating into the surrounding tissue. Right, the same tumors what we see under the microscope, the top picture shows the fibroadenoma of the breast which is forming a, a glands surrounded by stroma, they are completely benign glands look almost normal, um, the cytological atypia is not there whereas, in the, the picture below you see uh, a malignant tumor, a carcinoma of the breast where you have cells infiltrating, diffusely infiltrating the stroma and it has also elicited a host response in the form of lymphocytes. So, all the small blue dots that you see are lymphocytes whereas, the larger cells that you see are the malignant tumor cells. Yeah, the third property which is the most devastating of all the properties of cancer is that of metastasis. I say this because this is one uh, feature that is extremely difficult to treat. Once the, uh, uh, the tumor goes beyond the confines of the organ, it can really spread to any, um, any place in the body and it can metastasize to any organ. So, it then it becomes really difficult to treat and manage. So, this is this property which is the spread of the tumor to sites that are physically discontinuous with the primary site. That is the definition of metastasis and this is one of the most reliable feature of a malignant neoplasm. So, invasion and metastasis are the most um, sort of confirming or reliable features that dictates a malignant neoplasm. Right, this is a, a slice of liver taken from an autopsy specimen probably and all the white nodules that you see are uh, metastatic deposits in the liver uh, that has come from some other primary site, probably the colorectal or the upper GI or wherever, which are common uh, primaries that metastasize to liver. Just see how the almost the entire organ has been replaced by nodules of metastatic tumor. Now, how do uh, tumors spread? How do they metastasize? Now, there are three ways they uh, metastasize. Uh, one is seeding within body cavities. What do you mean by that? This usually happens with ovarian carcinomas, wherein uh, the cancer cells are just released into the peritoneal cavity and they just um, uh, go and occupy the entire spread of the cavity and uh, form metastasis. So, this is known as seeding within body cavities. Uh, the second important way is lymphatic spread, uh, mostly the carcinomas spread via the lymphatic route and the first site of uh, uh, metastasis of uh, carcinoma is usually the draining lymph nodes. For example, in the breast it is the axillary lymph nodes. Sometimes they skip the draining area and move on to another group of lymph nodes that can also happen rarely and these are known as skip metastasis. The first lymph node that, that is in the draining area of the uh, cancer is called a sentinel lymph node. Uh, how this is important we will come to in one of the later uh, uh, lecture series, how is the sentinel lymph node important in cancer uh, management. And lastly, uh, hematogenous spread or spread through bloodstream. Now, usually sarcomas spread by bloodstream. Now, these are all not all or none kind of phenomena because certain carcinomas can spread by a hematogenous route and some sarcomas can spread by lymphatic route. And since the root, two roots are connected, what starts off as a lymphatic spread can go on to become hematogenous also. So, these are not like um, rules um, that are always followed, uh, but usually carcinoma spread by the lymphatic uh, route and sarcomas by the hematogenous route. 
This is an example to show a lymph node uh, uh, which in which the subcapsular sinus, the first area to which an afferent lymphatic drains is filled with carcinoma cells. So, it is a draining lymph node probably f the axillary lymph node in a case of carcinoma of the breast. This is a, an example of a, a renal cell carcinoma that is the kidney and uh, on the top you s uh, towards the top of the kidney you see uh, in the upper pole um, you see a, a growth and it is also going into the renal vein. Now, renal cell carcinoma typically invades the renal vein and it can go grow along the renal vein right up to the right side of the heart like a snake it can go up and uh, this is very peculiar to renal cell carcinomas. Right. So, if we have to summarize the characteristics between benign and malignant uh, neoplasms, the characteristics that we have discussed so far. The first and foremost differentiation and anaplasia, a benign tumor is extremely well differentiated, resembles the uh, typical tissue of origin, whereas a malignant neoplasm lacks differentiation and it is often anaplastic. Rate of growth, usually a benign tumor uh, grows slowly and uh, may come to a standstill after a certain uh, uh, point. Mitotic figures are rare or even when they are present, they are normal mitotic figures, whereas malignant tumors are erratic may be slow to rapid and mitotic figures may be numerous and they could be abnormal mitotic figures. Local invasion characterizes a malignant neoplasm. It infiltrates the surrounding tissue. Remember the, the breast a specimen that I showed you and, um, uh, and whereas a, a benign tumor is usually expansile, well demarcated and is surrounded by a fibrous capsule and it does not invade the surrounding tissue. Finally, metastasis are never there in a benign tumor. If they are there, then it is not benign. So, it is absent and in malignant tumors, they are frequently present and uh, the larger and the more undifferentiated uh, the primary, the likely that it has metastasis. Thank you.